Good evening and welcome to RPS Distinctions Talks Live. Today I'm delighted to be in conversation with Ria Michelle, a very accomplished photographer who is passionate about crafting artistic imagery. She is self-taught and produces a distinctive and distinguished style of work. I know your father, Ria, David Cook, FRPS. Not only is he an accomplished photographer, but he is, was also a trustee of the RPS and ran the education side. So as a child, did your family influence you to become interested in photography? Thank you, Sue. It's so exciting to be here and to have this opportunity to talk about my work. So to answer your question, yes, indeed. Um, my father is a passionate and very accomplished photographer. He's a fellow too, actually. Um, my grandfather was a keen amateur photographer and his passion for capturing what interested him definitely passed on to my dad. I think when I was young, you know, photography was always around. It was you know, around both in the form of beautiful old cameras that my parents had collected together that were around the house and also in terms of the process of documenting. So, you know, when I was young, we were really lucky. We lived in beautiful countryside and we also traveled quite a lot. So there was always a lot for me to photograph. My first proper camera um, that I used was my dad's Pentax MX. It just had a 50 mil lens, so that's all I learned on. And it was actually a camera that my grandfather had bought for himself and used and then given to my dad one Christmas. So it was really special using that camera and learning on that camera. It wasn't lost on me, all the photos that had been taken by them before and having that kind of weight of history behind it. And I think, um, you know, in those early days, in those early years of learning, I was really documenting the atmosphere of a place, you know, how it made me feel and any intriguing details that were very new to me, especially when we traveled. And as I became more and more passionate about photography and, and using my camera to document how I felt, my dad actually took a step back so that I would have a freedom, you know, the freedom to develop without feeling any rivalry with him. And it wasn't something that I was really aware of at the time, to be honest, but it was such a kind thing for him to do to give me that freedom to kind of develop in my own way. And, you know, I think it was, it was actually years later when I'd found my feet as a photographer that he then took photography back up again. And actually, I think it was when I bought him his first digital camera. So in 2006, I bought him a Nikon D70. And he actually used that camera for both his LRPS panel and his ARPS, so his Licensing and Associateship panels. And so it's a really nice circle there. Oh, that's interesting. Do you by any chance still have the Pentax MX? It's probably a valuable antique by now. I do. I've still got it. It's actually surprisingly heavy. Um, I don't use it much anymore. Um, but it's a beautiful old camera and I wouldn't be parting with it, whatever its value, I have to say. <laughs> well, everything is relative, but as a comparatively young photographer, you've achieved so much that I could talk to you for hours. But we only have 45 minutes, so let's get started. Was there any particular photographer that had any impact on you in your early development? So one of the first things that I wanted to be when I grew up um, was a National Geographic or a wildlife photographer. I was really fascinated by the natural world and you know I was lucky we traveled a lot as I said and I got to see a lot of the national parks in America at a really young age and I think it was in one of those trips that I came across Art Wolf. So he's an American photographer, he's a conservationist and I think he's probably best known for his, his color images of landscapes and wildlife and he also takes a lot of pictures of native cultures. So I find his work really elegant in a lot of ways, his communication is really strong and his images are often very graphical and, and very artistic. And I know you asked me to find a few examples of pictures that I, you know, that I was really moved by, what attracted me to his work. Um, and it was difficult, but at a push I chose a few. So this is the first one, Andalusian horse. What he's brilliant at doing, I think, is capturing that decisive moment. And this image is a really great example of that. I also think the light is incredibly delicate. He's, he's really great at seeing light in that way. And, you know, this particular image, there's an incredible energy stored up in this moment. You know, it's palpable. It's, it's really emotional to me, this image. I also love how his images often make you work to decipher a pattern or fill in the blanks. And this image, Vulpine Blur, is a really great example of that. You know, it's capturing all that energy. 
What I found so fascinating about Art Wolf was that his approach to wildlife photography is a combination of both that classic photojournalistic approach that we all know so well, but also one of art photography. So he released a book in the early 90s that was called Migrations, and it was quite controversial at the time because while you know, two thirds of the images in the book were strictly documentary, you know, what you would expect, around a third had used cloning, which at the time was a really new digital technique. Um, but he'd used cloning to enhance the visual patterns in the images and create images with greater impact. So one of his most famous images in that book was this, which is a herd of zebra, and it was on the cover of the book, in fact. And he had actually cloned one of the zebra so that they were all going in one direction. Because, you know, there's always one going in the opposite direction when you want a shot like that. So he, he'd use cloning to correct that. And he wasn't hiding this by any means, but he was using this new technology to create a high impact image, you know, create impactful art with his, with his work. And that was fascinating to me because it was my first real exposure to the idea that enhancing an image to create a specific message, you know, to enhance its visual communication with digital manipulation, that that was possible. But it's not something that I really engaged with at all on a large scale until my fellowship panel. Well, I can see why you like those images. I must say the Andalusian horse particularly resonated with me. It's absolutely beautiful. Your educational academic background was very scientific. Did you find this an asset to your photography? Because science and art can often overlap so much. Yeah, so science and art have really always been dual passions for me. Um, you know, I, I actually think they do very much feed into each other. And for me, you know, one has always enhanced my ability to do the other. So I studied both at school um, for my A-levels. I couldn't choose between them. So when it was time to kind of pick what I was going to do at university, I decided to do natural sciences because as I wasn't going to choose, I thought that, you know, it would be easier to do photography as a hobby than science as a hobby. And I had to have both in my life. So, you know, it wasn't actually until I'd done my PhD and I'd done two postdoctoral fellowships that I became a full-time photographer. So for a long time, I did the two in parallel. Um, and even in my science, you know, I did a lot of imaging. I studied neuroscience um, and I did a lot of electron microscopy. So, you know, the cameras are a little bigger um, than, than what I use in my day to day now. But yeah, I mean, my, my mind is pretty logical. Um, I have a process and a strategy I like to follow. And that's the scientist in me, I guess. And it's been so helpful in developing my art, you know, learning how to see and how to manipulate light. It's, I guess, the artist in me that feels the light, you know, feels the atmosphere and the scientist that figures out how to capture it. Because, you know, I learned photography in a very methodical way of trial and error, um, you know, changing one parameter at a time and documenting what I found so I could learn from it. Um, and I guess, you know, the methodical, organized scientific approach has also really helped me immensely when it's come to managing, you know, the huge number of files that I create as a professional wedding photographer, you know, shooting on digital now. And, you know, very much also the business side of things, too. Well, having such an organized mind must be essential with your style of photography because it's just so exacting and brings out the perfectionist in you. You started your journey in the RPS by getting your licentiate. It would be great if we could see that panel if you happen to be able to, so we can see your progression. Absolutely. Well, here it is. Um, this panel, I think, really shows my roots. I got a licentia in 1998 and I shot it on transparencies, on slides. And it's, it's full of images that I'd taken on those family trips that I keep talking about. So uh, there are a lot of images um, from a trip to India, some from America, some from Italy, from Rome in there. And I think you can really see my style developing here, my love of storytelling and the moments in between. And you may not be able to see on your screen, it's quite small, but in that little bird in the top, um, on the top line, there's a little ruffle of feathers, the wind just catching it. And there's you know, a stillness to the man that's sitting on the beach. And I love playing with light. Um, and, and you can see that in the shadow on the cobbles in that last image. I actually remember taking that image there was a row cleaner that had just gone by seconds before and it made the cobbles all wet and reflected the sun and it was really, really bright. You know, the, the actual the day was very bright and hot and, and, you know, it was difficult to see it was so bright. So I underexposed the image so that I could capture all the texture and the reflections in those stones. 
This is one of my favorites from the panel. It's always hard to choose, but I really love the strong graphical nature of it and the expression in that baby. The, there's a suggestion of catch lights in the eyes, which I think is really important to, to kind of capture your attention, but there's a shadowiness too, you know, a furtiveness in its expression. And there's a tiny little bit of tongue sticking out, which you know, if you can see the image large, you'll notice. And I've got an eight month old baby at the moment, and this really reminds me of her. That's a good panel, Rhi, and even though things have changed over the years, I suspect that panel would still be just as successful today. Having successfully set yourself up now as a professional wedding and portrait photographer, it was 10 years later that you became an associate of the RPS. Obviously the criteria is very different from the L. Will you share that panel with us too, please? Yes, of course. I mean, the, the licentia is really all about showing your competency as a photographer. So your skill in handling a camera and in choosing the right settings for a variety of subjects. The associate is taking that next step into the art of it. So you've chosen a genre and you are crafting a panel that's going to communicate a specific purpose, which you're going to articulate in your statement of intent. So, you know, this is where you're going to show your own vision and your own understanding all the while illustrating that high level of technical ability, making sure that you're using techniques that are appropriate to the subject. So let me show you that right now. So I got my associate in 2008. So as you said, 10 years after my licentiate. And in that time, I'd done my PhD. I'd started shooting weddings on film. I discovered digital photography and I you know, started getting used to that. And there was a lot going on, you know, but I think what really kicked me off into working for my distinctions again was my father taking up photography again. So, you know, I think he was right. There was a little bit of rivalry in me somewhere. And once he started working for his distinctions, that I think is what kicked me off, it instigated my journey resuming. So, you know, now I was shooting weddings and portraits professionally. I decided that when I, you know, I put together my associate panel, I wanted it to be my personal work. I wanted to use the process of going through, you know, getting the associate panel together to grow in my own personal work. So I said to myself, no people, there were gonna be no people in this panel. Um, I still traveled a lot. And so the panel came out of my quiet observations of places just outside that busyness of people. I'd love to share my statement of intent actually, because I really think that that clearly explains my intent, you know, as it should. So the panel I called Still Life on a City Canvas. In modern times, we rush around our busy urban landscape, often without observing our environment, missing the art in our daily life. I am struck by streets and buildings worn by time, their strong geometry and their textures. I study the contrast between textures of reflective windows and worn, discolored, wet and dry concrete, and the interplay of light on these surfaces. Abandoned or utilitarian objects form still lives still life studies in this context. I see beauty and a weight of emotion in the decay. In this visual art panel, I try to create crafted still life images designed to evoke curiosity and emotion from the canvas of everyday urban scenes. Well, very different from your L panel. I must say I really enjoyed seeing that because I love graphic design, which is shown here in abundance. Ten years later, your business had become successful and you decided to go for fellowship. Where did this idea come from? So yeah, it took me another ten years to go for my fellowship. Um, for me, the fellowship was always the ultimate goal, you know, the pinnacle of achievement, both in you know, visual communication and technical ability. And to be honest, it felt like I would never reach that goal. Like it would always be something that I would strive for. So I was not gonna let it discourage me. You know, I absolutely was gonna go for it, but it was always that goal, you know? Um, and it took me a really long time to feel that I was ready to go for that. So for a while I toyed with using um, my wedding work and going for an applied panel. You know, I'd spent a long time developing that and I felt very, you know, very strong in it. but just as I'd felt with my associate, I wanted to do a panel of personal work that really stretched me. And actually my fellowship panel was entered as a fine art panel and it was done you know, purely for this purpose. These images were created purely for this purpose. It wasn't at the time anyway, commercial work in any way. So it was very much a fine art panel. 
And it was when this specific idea came to me, that was actually when I felt ready. It was when I found that idea. So let's look through some of the images or let's look through all of the images as I tell you about its conception. So I'd only recently discovered fine art children's studio portraiture at the time. Um, and I'd noticed a number of Dutch photographers who were doing old master type images, you know, stoic expressions on the children and using taxidermy animals. And they're very beautiful, they're of a tradition, but I thought, what if the children were actually interacting with the animals? You know, what if it caught the personality and encapsulated something of the children's passion and that the animals were actually alive. You know, the animals that appear in the images were actually alive. And that's where the idea for Project Animalia came from. So I did a proof of concept test shot, which I'm going to show you in a couple of slides because we're showing these in order. Um, and it's the girl with the hedgehog. So well, yeah, we'll show that in a couple of slides. So the hedgehog was actually one that had been rescued and nursed back to health by one of my husband's work colleagues. And I photographed it in their front room. So you know, every, every image has a little story behind it like that. So this is the image. Um, it was really when I gave this little girl a mounted print of this image, you know, that was actually the first time she'd seen the image. When I saw her reaction and I saw her eyes light up, that's when I knew I was onto something. You know, she couldn't fathom it because it, to her it was like a little bit of magic. It had never happened yet it looked real to her. So I really feel that, you know, when children discover that they share this world with other living creatures, it opens their hearts, it opens up their minds and it's, it's when they really begin to form empathy for others. So with Project Animalia, I wanted to encourage children's connection with, but also respect for the natural world by showing them interacting with their favorite animals through these digital composites. So my images, you know, they were narrating the importance of animals in our lives. You know, they fill our dreams, they star in our stories. They really teach us about our place in nature. But, you know, simultaneously, I wanted to use this project to remind people that wild animals only belong in our imaginations, in a project like this and in the wild, they are not and never should be pets. So I would love to share my statement of intent with you again um, for my, my fellowship because I think you know, it will really help, help you gain understanding of it. So in this project, I wanted to create meaningful portraits of children they could connect with. I had the idea to create composites of children with their favorite animals, but rather than the stoic atmosphere of Dutch masters paintings, I wanted to capture the personality of the children and animals, showing them interacting as if they were really in the same space. The aim was to create painterly, fantastical images that would look to the children as if they could be real. All images are composites. The children varied in age from two and a half years to 10 years and were photographed in my studio with parents present against backdrops I had hand painted. All animals were live and photographed in my studio at zoos, aquariums, wildlife parks, and in the wild on travel trips I have taken. I have devised compositions that would suit the personality of the children and the species they had chosen. So this was a really personal project for me. You know, it was something I was very passionate about and I hadn't seen any work like this around. And, you know, while I knew that the children and their parents were really inspired by it and they loved it, I had no idea how it was going to be received critically. And I, when I took it to the fellowship advisory day, I still remember how quakingly nervous I was to hear what other photographers would make of it. And, you know, since then I have been completely humbled by the response. Well, a truly beautiful and original panel. I know it's been much admired by many and I'm sure the viewers this evening who've not had a chance to see it before will be in awe. Now, Rhea, they do say never work with children or animals. You decide to do both. You obviously like a challenge. Did this present you with any difficulties? I'm sure there has to be a funny story lurking there somewhere. Yes, I hear this a lot. Um, but, you know, there's, there's a great simplicity to working with children and animals. You know, they're very honest in their reactions and they engage. Sure, you know, you need to work really fast and you need to know what you're doing and you need to play. You know, without a doubt, you need to play. So, you know, 
of course, you do have to be adaptable, um, you know, work around an idea, but it is so much fun. So I wanted to show you this picture in this context. Um, to be honest, the children were on the whole absolutely incredible, like better than I could have ever imagined. They really engaged with the process. They took direction where they needed to. You know, I do work really quickly when I photograph children. And there was one little boy who chose penguins, this little boy here. He was absolutely brilliant for the directed shot, you know, the one that I had in mind. Um, but, you know, when we got that in the bag, he decided that what he wanted to do was dance around being silly, you know, as little boys do. And I just kept shooting and I just let him be him. And, you know, when I was looking through the images afterward, this one frame I took, I mean, actually, you know, I knew when I'd taken the frame because you, ha you have that moment, don't you? But he looked as if he was conducting an orchestra and I could not resist but surround him with penguins to conduct. Um, and you can't see it here, but there's the one that's kind of closest to him in the light, it's shaking off water. And it just, you know, in the print, it's such a, it's such a fantastic energy to it. And it was actually this shot that made the panel, you know, not the one that I'd planned. So, yeah, I mean, in terms of the animals, the challenge really came in, you know, getting the right angle of view to match the child. Um, you know, certainly for those I photographed in zoos or wildlife parks, I needed to make sure that the angle of view was the same for both the child and the animal in the photograph so that it looked realistic when I put them together. Um, there were lots of multiple trips. Um, and of course, sometimes the animals just didn't put in an appearance even, um, you know, for me to get a shot. So that was a real challenge. I did actually bring some domestic dogs and cats into the studio for some shots with their owners present. Um, and we lost a few cats, you know, behind the backdrop and under my computer desk um, for a good few minutes. So that was fun. Well, you actually seem to get away quite unscathed, really. <laughs> Can you explain to people how you approached the fellowship application? Because I'm sure we all want to know how on earth you made those images just look so extraordinarily realistic. Sure. So um, once I had the idea that I wanted to create these composites of children with their favourite animals, I asked for volunteers for the project. So the idea being that they would get a fine art mounted print in exchange for their participation and a model release. So, you know, I knew I would need a variety of images to choose from to get that final panel, you know, looking really well when all images were hung together. I knew that I would need a variety. So I made sure that I did at least two original composite images for each child that were very different, both in their composition and their energy so that I had that choice. And, you know, I started by asking the parents in advance, you know, what was the child's favorite animal? And once I knew what the animal was, I looked through my archives to see if I had an image that I'd already taken. So that was really useful in terms of things like the lion and the hummingbirds that I had already taken pictures of on travel tricks. And, you know, they are things that I couldn't shoot locally. Um, so, you know, if I, if I didn't have an image I could work with, then I would look to see if there was somewhere local I could go to photograph it. So I was really grateful that nobody said polar bears or pandas because there really aren't any close to Southampton that I know of. Um, so, you know, I, I then I contacted the local zoo or aquarium or wildlife center that had that animal that I wanted to photograph to get permission so that I could use the images of their animals in my work. So all the children's portraits were taken in my garden studio, which is where I'm sat right now. Um, it's a garden room, so it's got a low, you know, slightly sloping ceiling. It's only five by three meters, the whole room. So that includes my working, my editing space as well. Um, so my, my work in my shooting area is probably maybe three by three meters. And I shoot from just outside that sort of behind where I'm sitting right now. So you can see um, I've got my largest backdrops mounted on rollers at the back. Um, I had a large hand painted kind of golden gray tone canvas that you'll see in quite a few of the images, a black canvas. Um, and then I had two kind of separate ones that weren't on rollers, the blue one, which is pretty big, and then this small gray one. And I hand painted them all myself. I, I got drop cloths. So just, you know, like the sort of thing that you dust sheets that you throw over things when you're painting the walls. Um, and I painted them with a, a mixture of emulsion and acrylic paint to get the colors that I wanted. So I used white emulsion and mixed the color in. And it was a lot of fun. Um, in terms of the kit that I use in the studio, I have a really simple setup. So I shoot using a Nikon D750 and I use either a Sigma Art 50 millimeter 1.4 lens or a Nikon 85 millimeter f1.4 lens. And I have just a one light setup. So 
I use uh, the Profoto B1X off camera flash that you saw in that picture with a five foot Octobox diffuser. So it's a wireless light, um, which is great, you know, and it's got that, that Octobox has got two diffusion layers, which, you know, makes it super easy for me to change the direction or the, the quality of the light, you know, how hard or soft it is just by, you know, changing the, um, the amount of diffusion that I've got on that Octobox and just swiveling it. And, you know, having no cables was pretty important because children and animals running around the studio, it's a small space, you know, my tiny, tiny space setup here, it was really important. So simple setup, but works really well for me. Creatively, there are a few considerations for the panel, for sure. Um, planning and visualization, they were obviously always gonna be really important. Sometimes I had the image of the animal before the child. Sometimes I didn't, sometimes it was the other way around. So I had to have a few conceptual ideas up my sleeve in case one or the other, you know, I didn't quite get what I wanted. So I had to be flexible, um, you know, just as I described with that boy and the penguins. And I, I had to do things like I had to match the depth of field in the two images. I had to, as I said, match the viewpoint. Um, and I had to match the lighting, you know, the quality of the lighting to get them to sit together well, to get them to look realistic. To some extent, I also wanted to match, for example, the clothes on the children to get, you know, the concept working. So, for example, I might have an element of the clothing that acknowledged the climate that the animal lived in. Um, or I might match the colors of the clothes to those of the animals. But, you know, I didn't want to be, I didn't want to overdo it. I didn't want it to look too contrived. So it was just a kind of a nod to that. Um, the animals, you know, they were all photographed in complex backgrounds. So I had to cut them out um, and, and put them in my backdrops. And that got easier as I got better practice at it. You know, it was all done by hand. You know, I didn't use any kind of fancy software to do it. Um, and I painted back in the detail and the fur and the feathers around the outlines to get it to look really real. It sounds a little bit crazy. It sounds like a big task, but it got pretty quick, um, relatively speaking. You know, I did over 60 of them. Um, so I would actually love to show you some images in more detail to illustrate some of the process so that you can see what I'm talking about. So, you know, I'm, I've mentioned a couple of times and I can't emphasize it enough, you know, how, how important it was that my viewpoint was right, both, you know, that it matched the child and the animal so that when they came together, it looked really realistic. So this is one of those images where that actually played a really big part um, of making, you know, making this image come to life. So at Marwell Zoo, which is the local zoo to me here, when you view the cheetah enclosure from the walkway, the walkway is actually really high up. So you're always looking down from a really steep angle onto the cheetah. And there's a big rock in the middle. Um, and when the cheetah are right up on the very top of that rock, you know, it's the same height as you. So you're at, the, you're at eye level. And in all my visits over all the years that we've been here, I've only ever once seen the cheetah up there. Um, and that was the time I took the shot. So a little bit of serendipity or perseverance, you know, but that, that's what I think really made this image possible. So I also mentioned, you know, I needed for the shots to match, for the quality and the direction of the light to match as, as best they could. So, you know, the live animals, with the exception of the cats and dogs and bearded dragon, which were photographed in the studio, were taken outside or underwater. And, you know, I needed to match the quality of the lighting um, in the studio that I, you know, that I lit the children with to, to how the animals were lit even if I hadn't taken that animal shot yet. So, you know, to be sure, it helped that I was familiar with the zoos and aquariums and wildlife centers around here. You know, we go fairly regularly. So, you know, even if I didn't have a shot yet, I was generally familiar with the type of light that I was gonna need for a certain shot. So for example, this one, I knew that the light in the aquarium was gonna be coming from above and that it would probably have quite a lot of contrast in it. Um, you know, that, that it was going to be a harder sort of light. So that's what I needed to replicate to make this shot work. But, you know, in almost every shot, I still needed to do some carving out of the light, you know, and, and some more than others. Um, I needed to, to make it properly match, you know, the directionality of the light, the position, the depth of the shadows. And I actually thought it would be really fun if I showed you the originals and the final. Um, and I thought I'd pick this image. So at the top, here are the two original images that I'd taken. And here's the bottom, you know, the final image on the bottom, which is the tiger that came to tea. 
So I use a Wacom tablet for all of my editing. Um, it's so invaluable with this sort of fine work. It, it's really a lot of drawing and painting effectively. So to talk you through the process, the first thing I do, um, you know, in, in this image, if we're talking about this image, would be to cut out the tiger from its original background. And as I said, I found this easiest to do by hand. So I, I would cut around it very crudely on the original image and paste it in place um, on my on top of the image of the child. So that this, you know, this um, this it, child of the boy here, the, the boy um, here. And I then did the refined cutting out on the layer in the composited image. So I knew I was going to have to paint in some fur afterwards. So it was really a matter of just getting a good edge. And I, you know, I just used a soft brush um, in Photoshop for that. I, I then resized the animals to make sure that they were a realistic size. Um, but to be honest with the big cats, I went for the smallest of their size range so that it didn't look too scary. Um, and then it was about carving out that light. So to do that, you know, I'm in Photoshop, I take that layer that's got the tiger on and I made three copies. And for two of those copies, I adjusted the exposure. So I had one that was much darker than my original and then one that was much lighter. And then using layer masks, I just painted in the lighter and the darker areas to create that depth, you know, to carve out the light as such. Um, and yeah, I, I also use some adjustment layers and some gradient tools to just, you know, add a little bit of finessing there. I also made some minor adjustments in color temperature um, so that the color temperature of the two images matched. So it looked like they were being lit by the same light. And actually with, some of the animals, you know, are shooting them through bars or wire. And although you couldn't really see that in the image, um, some of the color often came through from the wire. So you'd have areas of fur that were, you know, strips of fur that were kind of slightly green. And so I needed to correct that color. And I just used, um, you know, another layer and I used, uh, you know, that layer to adjust that color, um, you, just using the blending mode. And then, as I said, I hand painted in some details. So the fur around the edge, just to make it look really real. And again, just more layers. So I put um, one layer on top of the stack of tigers and one um, below. And then I just painted on those two using different colors that, you know, that I was picking up in the fur. Um, it's actually really difficult to see the sort of detail even on the final prints, but I think it really makes all the difference to how real it looks. So, yeah, staging convincing interaction was always going to make or break this panel, you know, make or break this concept. So it was all about play and getting the kids fully engaged in the idea. Some were really, really young, you know, two and a half. So obviously they didn't necessarily follow at all what we were doing as an endpoint, but they just loved the play of it. And, you know, I talked to them, I talked them through what was happening in my conceptualized image. Um, you know, the sharks are swelling around your legs or, you know, reach up to touch your turtle that you love. And um, it, you know, we also, especially for the youngest ones, we used cuddly toys in place of the animals, you know, to get them to look in the right place. And so I get the parents involved, you know, flying cuddly toys around the room. Um, and it was so much fun. Um, this image is, is, yeah, definitely one of my favorites. I had the idea that, the monkey could be pulling on his shirt. Um, and, you know, the, I think the monkey in reality was pulling on a piece of fruit in the tree in the original image. Um, but I had my husband, Jake, pull on the little boy's shirt. And it was just a matter of getting rid of his hand and putting the, the monkey in. And I think it makes for a really fun image. This was by far the most kind of planned shot um, in the panel. It, it's easier as the girl was much older. So she was the 10 year old. Um, because she understood exactly what we were doing and that allowed me to be a lot more ambitious. So that she could look as if she was suspended in water, I actually took three images to composite just for her. Um, so, you know, I, I knew I wanted her to look as if she was floating. So the first one was to get her legs in the right position, not touching the ground. So for that, you know, she jumped. And then, you know, I thought about the pose. So I had another one where we had her arms and her head in the right position. And then the third was her hair. So she threw her hair from side to side so that we could get that kind of fan of hair so it looked as if it was you know, floating in the water. And I wanted to get the look of a shaft of light coming through the water. And I had a variety of images of the penguins swimming in and out of light in their kind of artificial ocean at the zoo. 
So it was a matter of positioning them in the composition to make that shaft of light look really real. Um, of course, images with multiple animals in took a lot longer to produce, but I really like the way this one turned out. Phew, what a lot of work. Such attention to detail and excellent photoshopping skills obviously of paramount importance to make these images just look so very lifelike, amazing and the well-deserved fellowship. Now you're on the licentiateship panel as a member and applied panel. What's it like to be on the other side of the fence, assessing instead of being assessed? I find it really fulfilling and personally very expanding. Um, you know, seeing the work of so many different photographers and critically looking at what they've done with respect to the defined criteria, it's really honing my eye in terms of giving me a greater appreciation for the development of, of personal style and visual communication, because I'm looking at so many different people's work um, and it's, you know, it, it's a real privilege. It's an honor for me to be a part of that process. It's something I never would have imagined, you know, ever being. Well, thank you, Ria. I'm sure with your critical eye and attention to detail, you're going to be a great asset to the assessing team. Well, you now have a husband, two small children, a thriving business. You teach, you have your fellowship. I'm not sure if I dare ask really, what next? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'm, I'm doing a lot of photography teaching at the moment, actually, and I'm, I'm really passionate, as you might have picked up, about that development of personal style and visual communication through images. Um, I'm teaching, you know, new photographers who are starting their journey and creative entrepreneurs how to develop this, you know, visual communication, this personal style while they're mastering their kit. So, you know, creating consistency in what you're producing it's so important if you're in business, either as a photographer or if you're, you know, sharing images of the things you make. So I'm, I'm really fascinated by that and I'm spending a lot of time on that. Um, I actually, you know, I, even in lockdown, I created a, a collaborative course with a very accomplished and inspirational marketer. Um, and we released this during lockdown as well. And I've enjoyed that so much. I am doing a lot of work with the RPS in my capacity as an assessor, um, you know, doing uh, online, uh, online um advisory things which has been just so fulfilling and enlightening um, and I suppose in my personal work I have this whole new compositing project mapped out um, so the idea with that one is reflecting the character of a child um, in a botanical concept so playing on that Victorian association that they had of personality traits with different plants um, and I had I had a whole sort of set of shoots all booked in all set out all planned um, and I had a wonderful florist that was involved who was going to help me create these amazing things and lockdown hampered the whole thing um, bless her heart my five-year-old has very kindly let me do some proof of concept images with her and you know you never know maybe the whole project will end up being her but it's great to be playing again it really is I knew I shouldn't have asked what energy and commitment Ria, thank you so much for such an insight into your photographic journey. Absolutely amazing what you can achieve. You have to be ambitious and determined. I'm sure after this wealth of information, there are going to be some questions wait asked. So hopefully you'll be able to answer some of those. There are some questions coming in. Um, first of all, what does your father think of your work? Oh, what does he think of my work? He's always been, my, both my parents have always been ridiculously supportive. Um, they are very good at telling me what they think though. Um, they're, not, they're not just gonna tell me everything's great. Um, they have been very supportive. They, they love it, I hope. Um, but, you know, they've always told me they love it. And um, yeah, I think anything that is very much there is a lot of me in this panel. I know that says, you know, when you talk about personal style, I think it, it does become something that is, it's how you use light, it's how you use composition. It actually, you know, the, the photographer is always present in every image they create. Um, and these images are very me. They do have my stamp all over them in the way that I use light, the way I use composition, you know, what I've chosen to put together, the, the emotions the reactions that I'm getting in the kids they, they're reacting to me or they're reacting to the situation I've created and so I think they see a lot of me in it 
um, if that makes sense. So I think that, that for them, you know, they, they've, they've said that they're very proud and um, yeah, I believe them. <laughs> Someone's asking, what would your three tips be for somebody starting out in photography? Oh, three tips. Um, so I think that the first thing, I mean, there is always going to be a mindset piece that, you know, you need to, to go after it. You know, you can absolutely learn what you need to do. Um, and you need to have that growth mindset that, you know, you, you, you can grow into the photography you want to be you need to learn to explore you know you're not going to get everything right first time and neither should you um so you're listening to feedback and you're going to try and you try again you know surround yourself with people who inspire you um so that you're you're going to be pushing yourself up to the next level you know so it's going to get you to work harder if you surround yourself by by people who are slightly better than you if that makes sense it's going to push you further faster so i think that would be one um i think it's really essential to learn to see and critically assess your own work but also others work so you know when i started out i know this feeling it's so easy to be overawed by some other photographer's work and to feel like you're never going to get there you know but rather than doing that look at their work and see what is it that you love about their work you know what is it that you're responding to because if you start to do that for everything you look at that's how you're going to start developing your own personal style by by pulling together the things that you love that you respond to in in whatever you see um and it's it's you know there's two parts coming together to become an accomplished photographer you've got to master the technical aspects and the visual communication and then you've got to develop that personal style um so by you know learning what you respond to visually that's how you're going to develop your personal style so i think the third point is really that technical aspect so you know, you could do, you know, I'm not going to say you could do worse because you could do, you know, a really good thing to do would be to go and look at the licentiate um, criteria, you know, go and look at those criteria. They're on the website. It's a great outline of, you know, the technical skills, the, the communication skills that you need to consider and master. So go and look at those and, and teach yourself, you know, stretch yourself. Um, so yeah, those, those would be my three things, the mindset, the development of your personal style by critically looking at other people's work as well as your own and, and, you know, really go after your, your technical mastery, um, and, and use the licensing criteria as a place to start. Thank you. And well, having given you a difficult question, I'll give you an easier one this time. What size did you do your prints? Um, so they are seven oh ooh, seven by ten they are seven by ten inches inches right okay thank you <laughs> and somebody's asking how did you manage to get the skin tones right how did i manage to get the skin tones right um that's an interesting question in the sense that i i think because i'm a wedding photographer so i you know and a portrait photographer i am always dealing with skin tones um it's about you know you, you getting your white balance right um in in situ i mean you can you can you can absolutely you know adjust your white balance you know in in your editing software afterwards but it really helps if you if you you know get your white balance right on on the scene i mean obviously with studio work it's much easier because you're using the same light all the time it's not like you're going into seriously color cast environments i've you know i've got a great setup here so you know it's not something i struggled with i have to say and do you do your printing yourself i do i do i always have um i <laughs> in my insanity back in the day i used to print all my own wedding images not the albums but the the prints that i used to give out um so yeah i mean i have a i have a beautiful Epson printer. Please don't ask me the model number. I don't retain that sort of information once I've decided what I want. I don't remember it, but um, I could look it up for you. Um, it's, it's a fantastic printer, but it's an A3 plus printer, um, Epson uh, professional printer, and it's absolutely brilliant. Someone's asking, what do you think your major expertise is? Is it in the photography or in Photoshop? Photography. In photography. Thank yeah, you. because I think, I mean, that's an interesting, that's a really interesting question. Um, I think for me, 
I wouldn't call myself an expert in Photoshop purely because I don't know how to do everything in Photoshop. So maybe that's talking to my mindset rather than, than anything else. But I have learned how to do what I need to do. So for example, you know, I, I retouch portraits, so I know how to do frequency separation, but I don't know how to do absolutely everything. I, you know, if there's some new challenge, I will go and learn what I need to do to, to meet that challenge. Um, I think it helped, I mean, this is gonna sound a little bit funny, but I think it helps that I was, you know, I, I, I always taken photographs, but I was also an artist at school. I did a lot of painting and drawing. And this to an extent, you know, the Photoshop part of it is very much painting and drawing. So I don't really, you know, it, I'm using a tablet, I'm using a pen. Um, so it feels more like that. Whereas I feel like the photography side of things, that's, you know, I've been a professional now for 14 years. I ha there's, a, there's a lot of complexity to shooting weddings and shooting portraits and your interaction with people and how you handle light. And I feel like that's been a, a much greater journey. Um, so yeah, I would say that, that, that I've grown more, like my expertise is greater in that part of it, yeah. And of all the images you've done, Rio, which do you think is the most difficult um, to composite and to produce the final result? So of the ones in the panel, which was the hardest, um, I would say probably the one with the ducklings, because they're really fluffy. <laughs> Um, I was thinking about the one, like the, the, as I, the one that I showed with the penguins, with the penguin swimming. Um, there was a lot of parts of that, but the penguins were incredibly easy to cut out. So that was fine. But the, there are so many little ducklings and they're really fluffy. And also the yellow was really challenging um, to get that. Like when you're, when you're playing with the, the shadows and things on that, that was, that was a real challenge to get that to look right. Definitely. Right. And uh, what is your next challenge? So I think, yeah, this, this new composite work um, with the botanical theme, um, I thought originally that maybe it wasn't, I didn't need to do kind of a composite so much, like I might need to embellish it a bit or add a few more flowers in that until I tried to do some with my daughter and she was like, these ferns are itchy, get them off me. Um, and she was, and she's absolutely brilliant. But to be fair, the ferns were itchy. So I then realized pretty quickly that that was gonna have to be composited as well which kind of excited me um but i think to get that to be really impactful it's going to be a real challenge because there is there are so many aspects to it and there's so many different ways that it could go um but i have some fantastic ideas and i really want to get my teeth into it so yeah and another question is um how many images did you have to produce to manage to get to the final 21 so I think I mentioned I did about 60, I might have been 65. Um, so some of them, you know, most children just chose one animal, some chose two, one chose I think four, um, but they were all ones that I had. So I just, you know, I went for it. Um, so it depended on the child, but I did at least two or three for most of the children. Um, and as I said, that, that was quite deliberate because I knew that when I put them together, you know, some were always gonna be more successful than others because it's just, you know, the way it works out. Sometimes, you know, the, there's just an energy that sometimes is there and sometimes isn't so much. Um, but I tried to, with all of them, I would do, you know, one that was a wider angle shot. So actually like the, the two that are behind me, um, one that's a wider angle shot where there's a whole um, body of the child and one where it's more kind of waist up. So I tried to do that for each one because when I was putting them together, you know, I, I wanted everything, I, I wanted to be able to have that choice to create that final image that is the panel when it's on the wall. Um, I knew that I was going to have to to have that choice. So yeah, about 65. Right. And there's just one final, very brief question. What size was your backdrop? So they varied. Um, I got, I, the um, canvas that I bought was nine by 12 feet. Um, and then, you know, I cut them down. So the, well, the biggest ones I didn't. So the, the black one and the gold one were much larger, but like the one that I did for the, you saw in the picture, the gray one, that's the one on the, the picture of the cheetah that's behind me. That was, um, was actually quite small. So I think it's about half that size. So it's probably, I mean, it's maybe, I'm looking at it right now. Um, it's maybe six foot by, yeah eight foot something like that it's not very big at all okay well that's that's superb i think you've run out of questions there 
Once again, Ria, I'd really like to thank you for a truly inspiring evening. Our sincere thanks. I have no doubt that everyone watching will have really had a thoroughly enjoyable evening. And now I think we have um, some good offers from the RPS. So non-members attending, sorry, I haven't got this full screen. Non-members attend an online event before the 31st of July, receive 20% of new membership. Members who can refer your friends and receive three months free membership. And you can learn more by looking at the website with the offer or email membership at rps.org. And we have talks coming up next week, um, 2nd of July. We have Trevor Yerbury talking about his um, family trait of nude photography. And then on the 9th of July, we have Tessa Mills talking about contemporary photography. So I'm sure those will also be as interesting and look forward to them. So I think that's all we have for you tonight. Thank you all very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed it and keep well and good night. Thank you. <laughs>